Hello, uh, so this is Dr. Amig from Unabridged MD. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, so I have the immense privilege to have Dr. Calabresi with uh, us today. Uh, and he's uh, been, uh, um, I'm a fan of Dr. Calabresi for a long time. I've uh, discovered, and of course, in the rheumatology world, we all know who Dr. Calabresi is. Uh, um, he is a professor of medicine at the Cleveland Clinic, Lermer College of Medicine. He's also the director of the R.J. Fasenmeyer Center for Clinical Immunology. Uh, he has been practicing clinical immunology and engaging in research and education at the Cleveland Clinic for over 35 years, even though it doesn't look like it. <laughs> and he is the author of over 300 manuscript chapters and editorials on the subject of clinical immunology. And uh, the way that I discovered Dr. Calabresi is through his work on all of the research uh, to uh, research in immunology, but not necessarily, you know, when we think of immunology, we're thinking very heavy uh, T cells, B cells. So th there is definitely a lot of work that Dr. Calabresi does uh, in there, but there's also all of the work that he's doing in Qigong, in uh, meditation, in uh, uh, what, like how best to empower our patients. So what are the things that we can all do to improve our immune system? So Dr. Calabresi, thank you, Len, that, thank you so much for coming. Oh, we're so excited to have you. I'm a little bit starstruck here. <laughs> oh, Isabel, please. <laughs> so, so there are so many topics I would like to discuss on this episode, um, but I had to make a choice, which is not something I can do very often, but in, in this case, I really wanted to, um, I would love for you to come back and discuss more things, but for this episode, I'd like us to focus on your work on Qigong and then your work on what you call the healing effect. Um, and so first, could you tell, tell the audience, what is Qigong? Well, Isabel, I, I'm, I'm happy to talk of, uh, about Qigong and I, I'm certainly far from a Qigong master, uh, but uh, you know, there's a journey here and I, I give me a minute and I'll, I'll tell you the journey. So, you know, I, I've been doing clinical immunology for many years and I do rheumatology and I do infectious diseases and I run this center that specializes in, you know, rare and unusual uh, immunologic diseases. And over a lifetime, you know, I have attracted and have seen you know, so many people with medically unexplained syndromes that, you know, putatively are immunologic in origin. And this includes uh, ME-CFS, uh, which I've been struggling to understand for many decades. Uh, chronic, do you, the, do you want to? The, the, you know, chronic fatigue syndrome. Yeah. Um, you know, and a myriad of other conditions that people come with abnormal lab tests, um, but really don't fit, you know, a nosologic entity, uh, lupus or vasculitis, et cetera. And so in dealing with these patients who, by our definition of, of being medically unexplained, but having signs and and symptoms compatible with immune dysfunction. I was always struck that you know that we had so little to offer, yeah. and uh, you know you can't put people on heavy duty immunosuppressive therapy if you don't know what's going on and there's no end organ damage that's pathologically defined. So I struggled, you know, with an approach. And then I, I, I realized that, you know, a, a, a long time ago that, you know, people, regardless of whether their syndromes are, are medically unexplained, you know, they all want to be well. Yeah. You know, if, even if their kidneys aren't failing, their lungs aren't failing, their hearts aren't failing, you know, they have a quality of life issue that is compromised by, you know, uh, generally, you know, poor health, social functioning, um, disturbed sleep, um, fatigability, often with post-exertional features, mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and, and beyond. And, you know, our 
canonical approach to immunologic disease has very little to offer them, mm -hmm. you know, in the absence of targeted therapies or biologic therapies or immunosuppressive therapies. So in and around the same time, um, this was kind of the beginning of work uh, in the field of uh, what we call social genomics. Uh, Stephen Cole and uh, colleagues on the West Coast um, started to identify that patients who have compromises of their social interactions, stress, mm -hmm. loneliness, uh, depression, um, and beyond, not only did they have a lower quality of life, but when you started to examine them at the molecular level, they have an altered gene expression profile. I found that totally mind blowing. And, and that profile, you know, affected both inflammatory pathways and interferon pathways. And so it, 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 it suggested to me that there, that there is likely an immunologic and you know, uh, immunogenetic basis for wellness. And that started the journey. And I said, well, you know, we are immunologists. We use state-of-the-art therapy. I've done clinical trials in virtually every biologic that's ever been approved uh, or in, been involved with it in some way, shape, or form. But at the end of the day, there's always something else patients that are interested in. What else can I do? What else can I do? And, um, you know, wellness behaviors uh, abound. There's hundreds of thousands of sites that you can go and look for wellnesses, uh, wellness advice. And I, I said, well, how many of these are evidence-based? What, what is the, you know, what, what, what is happening at the molecular level? And that is where we started to codify what we, tell our patients. So th that, that was the beginning. Yeah. That's so now, beautiful. having said that, let me take you to the next step. So, um, you know, this is a, an area of fascination. And, you know, we find that, uh, as with everything in wellness, there's bad information. Anything that's a quick fix is usually bad information. Um, and then there's, you know, uh, uh, higher quality evidence. And if you look at it critically, it, we find that there is a, you know, uh, uh, there are data to support that we can change immunologic functions uh, with how we eat, uh, how we sleep, how our physical activity is, and how we handle our stress. And so many years ago, I would you know, start to have these little discussions. And I've always worked incident to, uh, to uh, with, an, with an advanced practitioner. And over the past 20 years, um, Betsy Kirshner, who uh, is now a, a DNP and, and uh, involved in all of my research, you know, we started talking about this. What, uh, sorry, what is a DNP for my audience? <laughs> uh, a, a doctor, a, a nursing, nurse practitioner with a doctorate. Got it, okay. A doctorate. Uh, to, uh, and uh, is smarter than I am. And uh, so we would have these one on one conversations with patients. And we, you know, we kind of talk about what to do an anti inflammatory diet and what we, whatever we knew at the time. Yes. And then I said, well, you know, this is, this is all well and good if we have the time, but, you know, people want more. So we started to, so, well, let's write this down. Let's, let's give a handout that's, you know, a page or two. And then that kind of grew to you know five pages and ten pages and and then we we realized that we had resources to develop. Um, you know we weren't experts in behavioral modification. We're immunologists, but at the Cleveland Clinic we have a lot of experts. And we started collaborating with the Wellness Center, and I ultimately uh, had an appointment uh, um, in this center. Um, and uh, I found that there was a lot of intriguing work going on with mind-body, uh, mindfulness meditation. Uh, we had um, a, a, a bank of highly trained um, 
uh, e-counselors that could connect with patients to talk to them about eating, sleeping, et cetera. And we had a, a, a wonderful online programs with behavioral modification of sleep. Mm -hmm. um, so we put together a monograph and we give it to every single patient and I post it uh, on the Cleveland Clinic web website, clevelandcliniccme.com. Uh, dot org. Yeah, and put all the, all of those. And, yes, and I will Jack put. Jack posted on Room Now, and it's it's available, and I've given it to thousands and thousands of practitioners. Um, but I'll, I'll put some this for the for anyone that wants to. I'll put the link so that they can look at it. It's it's a very good monograph. I highly recommend it. Great. Well, we we uh, uh, and and it's 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 totally being revised right now. So six <laughs> months from now, we'll have a new one. So that was like step two. Mm -hmm. And then we started to say, well, you know, we're obliged to do some research in this area. We, I mean, if we believe this, you know, we have to have some equipoise to, to say, well, you know, does it make people feel good? And can we detect molecular signatures of this? And so we've started a number of initiatives and a number of projects, and we have developed an online program, 10 weeks in duration, that we call Immune Strength, which includes all of these how to eat, how to sleep, how to exercise, how to handle your stress through mindfulness meditation. And it's all done, you know, through uh, online. And we just got a grant from the National Psoriasis Foundation. We're uh, evaluating its uh, efficacy in 100 patients that have attendant stress and psoriasis. And patients with immune diseases have more intercute uh, mood disorders than the general population. So that, that's, that's moving over here. Um, uh, two years ago, we said, you know, everybody wants to do online meditation and everybody talks about meditation like it's something that you buy at the candy store and, you know, you, you take a deep breath and you're meditating <laughs> and other people, you know, go away for three months into seclusion and in silence. I said, it can't be the same. I mean, there, 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 there has to be, you know. It, we ha we have to know there must be a dose effect. There must be a type effect. So, I've been I've been meditating uh, all all too imperfectly uh, for a number of years, and uh, uh, we have an online program called Stress Free Now through the Cleveland Clinic. People pay a few dollars for it for lifetime access, and it, it's it, it's a nice program. So we said, let's do it. Let's do a study in stressed out healthcare workers. Everybody's stressed out, and so we. I wanted to know if you just if you just use it a few minutes a day, which is you know when you're telling stressed out healthcare workers the way to be not burned out is to go meditate. Well, people will get so angry. Said, well, if I have an hour a day to meditate, I wouldn't be stressed out. Sure. And so you can't tell people that. Mm -hmm. But you know, mindful breaths, brief periods of time, we were interested in it. So we we uh, we did a randomized controlled trial of low dose meditation. We said, you know, try to do this every day for four or five minutes. And um, we had a control group who listened to music, crossed them over, and then the primary um, endpoint is that we looked at their transcriptomic uh, response. So we actually mm -hmm. measured gene expression um, using, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 very powerful ex vivo uh, uh, techniques. We also mm -hmm. measured biomarkers and cortisol levels and cytokines and mm -hmm. everything. And we just uh, this was just published uh, uh, about two weeks ago. And, yeah, I've uh, read it. Yeah, you put you put it on Twitter. I read it, but uh, I I have a question. So because uh, well, since we have the author here, <laughs> might as well ask. Um, the first question that I have about this uh, this study. So you looked you looked at uh, uh, some outcomes that were biological, right? So for for our details, we're not just talking about how patients feel. We're talking at how their body are responding to those uh, those those interventions. So the first question I have to you for you is did you, because you chose a control group that went for music, I will tell you that when I listen to music, I go into a meditative state. <laughs> and, and, and it, you know, the music 
has the the profound capacity to transmit feelings. Yeah, and and as you saw that the the music group they felt per, they felt better. Uh, first, as, yeah, as well. right. They, they yeah. felt better as well. Yeah, uh, you know, in the in the world of of meditation research, and believe me, when I uh, I dip my toe into all these little areas of wellness, I am not a a a a, 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 a meditation expert, and I'm not a qigong expert, but I'm an immunologist who's interested in a lot of things. Um, there's no universally accepted control. You know, yeah. if you do nothing, um, you know, then you have anticipation that you're going to get something later. Mm -hmm. um, you have to offer something. So, yeah, good point. And, and so, so my question, though, is when you probably check the baseline, so before the intervention, cytokines and, and you know, yes. did you see a difference for all of, and, and I think I know the answer, but I want to, I want you to share it with us. What difference did you see, whether it's, you know, stopping to listen to an app or stopping to listen to music? Okay. So with this low dose regimen of mm -hmm. four or five minutes, and actually at the end of the time, people only did it like four to five days a week. You, they, you know, mm -hmm. this is how we tracked it. Got it. Um, it made people feel better. Their stress came down, but no biomarker change. None. Zero. That's Nothing. after six weeks, correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. And so uh, we we and there are data to suggest that mindfulness meditation, when it's done in higher volumes, yeah. can change this. Uh, you know, but it, it requires. You know, if 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 wellness behavior was easy, we wouldn't be talking about this because mm -hmm. everyone would do it and everyone would be yes. well. Yeah. So we're we're struggling to find this and. You know, I'm still happy when people um, uh, meditate for a few minutes a day um, because I, I think that, you know, it, 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 it improves their well-being and that and that leads to other spin-off advantages uh, moving down the line. So, uh, you know, we can talk about that. So but I, I, I just, an example of how we're, we're doing this work. I, I love it. I think so. First of all, I'm going to pause here because I want to I'm going to share my own experience. I never meditated until until I hit 40, really. And my sister was like, you're in your midlife crisis, meditate. And I was like, yeah, that's not going to work. <laughs> and so, and it's only once I got, uh, uh, so that my, my auditors know that I had um, my uh, stage four cancer. So once I hit the stage four cancer, I was like, ooh, I need the placebo effect on my side. And I don't know what the placebo effect is for me. So I'm going to do anything that will help me get into a mindset of healing. So I started meditating very seriously and I started looking at the studies because, you know, we're, we're scientists and uh, the studies were 20 minutes. So I started doing 20 minutes, <laughs> uh, but I cannot keep it up. I, I haven't been able to keep it up, um, maybe because I don't have the wheel. I don't know. Or my life has become more busy, a busier. Uh, but I, I do. I do try to do 10 minutes. Uh, and. I usually tell my patients the studies that I've looked at uh, that shows, you know, difference in cytokines and um, that's 20 minutes per day for eight weeks. <laughs> but you're not going to stop at eight weeks anyway. You want to continue it uh, later on. I I'm, I'm really intrigued that if you're going to follow those patients and see if, for example, they are going to do more later on, like, can, can this be just the beginning of something bigger for patients uh, and for healthcare worker? Maybe they start have, in five minutes and then they move on to more. I have a feeling, um, and I feel this myself, uh, you know, it, it, at times during my own mindfulness meditation journey, I was doing, you know, very good and doing a lot of time. And other times I would lapse. Yes. But I think that once you have engaged in this. And once you have brought on those skills and that self-realization, that <clears throat> I really feel it makes you more of a mindful person. And you know when you you you, you can read your body better. So, I, I, and I've, heard, I've talked yes. to a lot of people like this, just like you who said, you know, I've done this, I've been very dedicated. I'm not as good at it now, but I, I, I know where, yeah. where I am uh, at, at a better place. And I, it's not an excuse, but I, I think it's an observation. And I think that's how I started looking for alternative yes. um, um, techniques to do the same thing. And that's when I turned to mind body. Um, and that's when I turned to Qigong. Okay, so uh, this is this is 
this is a wonderful thing. First of all, I wanna I wanna say this like for scientists like me, uh, and and I'm, I, it sounds like the Turkey Libraries, you, you were so open to it to begin with, right? But um, I have learned medicine as you want to show that anything works against placebo. So the way we are taught about placebo is always very negative in the in the, the medical world right now. The Especially world. in rheumatology. Oh, um, you think so? I feel like it's everywhere. <laughs> well, it is, but in rheumatology in particular, because our placebos are so good. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> you're you're correct. And um so no, I just I just want to share this and I, I we will talk about placebo after, but I want to share that seeing research on all of this is so powerful for us because we can actually share this to our patients. We can share the meditations research, we can share the Qigong, which I'm really hoping uh, uh, we're, we're discussing right now. Um, but that's so powerful for us as patients and for us as physicians, because we can say, hey, you know, yeah, this this medication works, but like meditation also works. And you cannot, you know, maybe, maybe we're going to learn that there is um, an effect the same way that if you take only half of methotrexate, it's not going to work as much as a full dose of methotrexate. So this is extremely powerful. And I think the message here is that our patients can be empowered to do things that don't require their physicians. Um, so that was the interim, uh, interim um, just interim thing. But um, in terms of Qigong, so uh, do, do you want to say what I, I love the definition of Qi? So do you want to explain to us what Qigong is? Uh, well, Isabel, you're, you're as a, much of an expert or more than I am uh, on Qigong. I'm a, I'm a mere poor practitioner uh, who's trying to study it right now. But, uh, you know, uh, when we talk about the access uh, 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 of, of immune wellness, we talk about diet, we talk about exercise, we talk about sleep, and then this access over here, uh, we, 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 we call stress. Okay. And that's, a, a re, that's an oversimplification, but that's the, you know, the exigencies of modern life. And we know that there are techniques to modify stress, to decrease our, our, our loneliness, to improve our, our, our capacity for social interactions, to become less anxious, uh, to become less depressed that are, um, integrative techniques, you know, um, th that are not pills and, and chemicals. And we classify these into two broad categories, top down, uh, which comes from the brain and mind. And we just talked about that. That's mindfulness meditation. Mm -hmm. And then bottom up, and that's using our bodies um, uh, to do this. And, and we have many things, uh, including you know the, the 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 ones that we're most interested in uh, um, uh, here are uh, uh, qigong, tai chi, um, uh, yoga, um, uh, things that have been around for thousands of years. There are also other uh, 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 natural um, uh, therapies. You know, ranging as you say, uh, you're talking about the healing power of music. Um, uh, Feldenkrais, um, hypnosis, yes. uh, on and on and on. But yes. let's 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 focus uh, for a bit on on qigong. Um, I, I have done yoga. I'm not very good at it. I actually have a, 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 a spondyloarthritis uh, variant, uh, which makes oh, it very okay. tight hamstrings, and I'm not very good at it. It's not it's, it's, it's not for me. And which is very important, actually, and mm -hmm. I, I'd love to hear your take on this, is that you have to find the thing that works for you. That's it's not, one thing doesn't work for everyone. And Pretty then, agree. Pretty and, agree. And so then Tai Chi, which is a an ancient, you know, uh, 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 martial art origin, uh, highly choreographed, yes. um, uh, uh, mind-body exercise, which I have taken class in, and very demanding, uh, a lot of memorization of movements. Um, I, I find it quite challenging, and and th this has actually been reduced for medical purposes too. Uh, you know, to from 
you know, the over 100 steps to 20 steps, yes. Tai Chi shit. Uh, yes. and, and I know a lot of people who love it. Qigong, on the other hand, is a, you know, a system of kind of, it, it is ancient as all of them. It's, you know, coordinated body posture and movement, breathing. Um, there's a component of focused attention and meditation. Yes. Um, there is a, it, it combines elements of, you know, martial arts training um, uh, and uh, as well as spirituality. And uh, over, <clears throat> you know, more recent times, um, it has been deeply rooted in um, traditional Chinese medicine mm -hmm. um, as, a, as a healing aid. And, you know, I didn't know much about it. I was interested in all these techniques to work on this axis. And, you know, I, it, it, there's a, a rich world of online uh, offerings. And I tried it for myself and it really clicked for me. Mm -hmm. And I recognized that it could be as demanding as Tai Chi with very, you know, physically demanding aspects. And then there were other elements that were so subtle and so gentle um, uh, that used, you know, breath and focused attention and posture. And I thought like, well, if I, all these patients that I see that range from people that can't get out of a wheelchair to get to the bathroom, versus people who are, you know, highly energetic, but stressed out, perhaps something like Qigong could be tailored to the individual um, to heal them. And uh, that's what we've been working on, trying to uh, develop programs that can, can where people can pace themselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, that word pacing is, deserves some explanation. Maybe we'll get to it later on. Yeah. But, I, I believe that, you know, it's not one size fits all. Yeah, yeah. So I started doing this in my office right here. And uh, uh, I found that I could do this uh, on a, on my breaks. Uh, I, 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 uh, and uh, I said, well, I've got to introduce this to my patients. And, you know, I, it was easy to start with, uh, of directing them to different sites, but I would have to talk to them about pacing. And then I started doing it with my patients um, in the room. And I told them how what this meant to me and to my degree of wellness. And, you know, once I did that, once they saw me do a few gentle movements, I could see that it, it transformed their whole notion of this. This was this was this was like a bond. Yes. And, and so that's where we decided, well, we're going to study this um, formally. And uh, like you, I know you have such a strong interest and, and you have uh, the same goals. Um, uh, I'm very excited about this uh, moving ahead. Oh, I'm, I'm so excited. Thank you for doing this. And, and uh, I, I always love uh, hearing that researchers are doing this. I, I will say um, one of the things that drew me towards Qigong is the idea that uh, of the Qi. So the way I explain it to people who have no idea what Qigong is, and it's usually, it's funny, it's usually physician that have no idea what this is, um, in my group at least, uh, of friends and family. The, the way I, I personally explain it is to say the Qi is the life energy. So you spell it Q-I and the life energy, and there is life energy around us and then there's life energy in us. And exactly the way that acupuncture, that when you're trying to unlo unlock the the, blocka the blockages that are going on in your body because of the chi not moving, flowing, of, uh, you know, without any issues, you're using uh, acupuncture. You can actually use qigong to do this. And so you're. So this is actually fascinating to me. So you're using your movement to move the chi. But there's a whole um, area of Qigong where you can use your mind to move your body, yes. which I find fascinating because, as you mentioned, someone that's in a wheelchair, you can actually tell them you can move inside your brain. Like you can actually imagine that you're moving the Qi inside of your body, which is so powerful. Like someone that has a stroke telling them to move yes. in their mind is so powerful. And I use a lot of seated Qigong uh, uh, as well, particularly people with yes. postural orthostatic tachycardia, uh, yes. et cetera. It's a great way to start. And yeah. our, we have a very big 
uh, POTS program here. And the guy that heads it, Robert Wilson, is being coming a certified Qigong. Oh, instructor. wow. Right. Oh, so we, we're we're all into this, but we're ready to we're ready to study it in a in a way like we looked at mindfulness meditation at the molecular level, and um, uh, apply this to uh, fatigue like states, neurocognitive states, including uh, long COVID, which is yes. where we are headed with this. Yes. No, that's wonderful. Thank you so much uh, for all of those. Uh, information on on what uh, studying you're doing, what uh, research you're doing on Qigong. Um, I'd like to take us to the healing effect. And yeah. the reason I'm so interested in this uh, is that, you know, when I got diagnosed with stage four, <laughs> and I didn't actually look at the, at the statistics because I was like, I don't want to know about how, like what are the chances of potentially dying? And so I, I was like, I'm gonna make sure that my mind is very clear, very in a very positive state. Um, and and I was, I've been fascinated uh, and so involved with the idea of what is placebo. And when we had this discussion, a, a little discussion before um, you came in into the, the podcast, you told me, we actually call it healing effect now. And I love it because it is so much more than just placebo, right? It's it's yes. it's this relationship between you and the patient. It's the relationship. So especially in a time at a time where the relationship doesn't seem to have so much importance anymore. And I, I sometimes get to see like in, in the uh in a lot of places, I hear that you know you see the patients once, and then someone else is seeing them, and there's a lot of turnover. How can we, you know, establish that relationship with the patient, and how can we make sure that the healing effect works, and how can we use it in our, you know, on our yes. side because it's so powerful. We keep thinking, oh, this is not good. We should not use it when it's so important because it adds to our patient's uh, life. Um, can Can you tell us what you have yes. found? So for the for the listeners, you know, placebo. Everyone has an idea of what placebo means, and unfortunately, as you said, it has many negative connotations. It involves something, some trickery, um, that you're tricking a person into thinking that they're feeling better, and um, and it also is um, uh, misunderstood that it involves the application of some type of inert substance, like here's a pill to take uh, uh, here. So both of those are, 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 are outmoded notions. And that, um, uh, you know, we know what placebo effect is, is that people who, who can feel well in response to some type of intervention that is, you know, not pharmacologically based uh, it's, uh, in a study, um, but, you know, somebody gets the active pill and somebody gets, you know, uh, the, the quote sugar pill, etc. So it's it's an inert substance, but at the end of the day, both patients have uh, less pain, less fatigue, uh, more well-being. Trying to figure this out, as it turns out, one of the most powerful placebos is the way that the practitioner and the patient interact with each other, and um, this has been known for 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 centuries and mm -hmm. and you know one doctor says that he is such a great doctor his patients love him um uh that that used to be thought of as good doctoring yes uh, and it's it still is good doctoring and some people innately do this um others say like oh he's really smart but you know he's not you know he's he, he doesn't listen to people and he doesn't do this and do that well, it's been found through detailed studies uh, over the past several decades that that relationship can be uh, cultivated to generate placebo response. Now we, you know, placebo response is particularly good in these wellness domains of making people more empowered. It's been shown that, you know, people who, who generate this do better with all their diseases, including cancer. Mm -hmm. um, and the domains in this in this uh, interaction include things uh, such as professionalism. You know that that means 
uh, the patient is more confident in mm -hmm. that practitioner that he knows what he's talking about. Warmth and empathy, and and I this is the area that I'm particularly interested in, um, where two people can arrive at the same wavelength. That you know, empathy is being able to stand for a moment in that patient's shoes, and that patient knows it. Um, mm -hmm. That kind of that that instantaneous moment of of mutual sharing, uh, very very potent. And that's between uh, that that is, that is not only just the doctor or the nurse sitting there talking to the person, but the acupuncturist. Yes, if they have that relationship. It makes their tools more powerful. Um, uh, the environment uh, of the of the uh, of the setting, you know, being seen in a calm environment with, you know, good, you know, I have my my uh, um, uh, aromas going in my office uh, uh, all the time, and I like to surround myself with things. And when my patients come and sit in my office, they go, oh. This is this is wonderful. So all of these things can be manipulated and taught and yeah. and tested. And my my colleague and collaborator, uh, Dr. Luana Coloca uh, from the University of Maryland, one of the foremost placebo um, researchers in the world, said, you know, the the whole name placebo to the public is is so negative that this interaction uh, should be named the healing effect. And uh, I love that. And I think when I do Qigong with my patients, um, that's part of the healing effect. Mm -hmm. When when you validate them, that's part of the healing effect. You know, no matter what you have, you know, this notion of it's all in your mind is so negative. It's so derogatory. This is, mm -hmm. you know, this is, you know, Rene Descartes, you know, the, the, there was the mind and the body. Well, we don't think that way. We are one thing. And, um, um, you know, I, I, I tell my patients invariably, uh, I hear you, um, your symptoms are real, uh, they're not in your head, and they're not your fault. Mm -hmm. So let's start there. And, you know, maybe that settles the anger down, because I've been to so many places and I've heard so many things. Mm -hmm. And now we talk about, you know, what we can do to make you well. And, you know, that does not negate the fact that we are using every technique and every molecular therapy and every targeted therapy in the world to, uh, and looking for the, uh, you know, molecular basis of their illness. But we don't stop there. We combine this yes. in, 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 in a way that we do both. I mean, it's not an either or gambit. And uh, I, I, I'm very interested in teaching this in the medical school and um, I, I talk about this with clinicians, and when they hear this, it registers to most. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really, it's it's very, very interesting because especially in the rheumatology world, um, so I, I see patients post-COVID, um, but I've realized that a lot of my colleagues do not like to see patients post-COVID because they feel that they have nothing to offer them. And I'm like, no, we have us to offer them. Like, that is huge like this relationship that we have this listening this active listening this um like teaching them about you know meditation mind body exercise qigong um and and to me that is actually probably even more powerful than a medicine than than a, than a drug well it is right now because we don't have many medicines and, exactly. and you know we you know we make the diagnosis we treat things that we can you know if there's dysautonomia there's things to do. But, you know, patients who come are often panicked and they're, yes. they're not empowered. Yes. And this only serves to amplify um, symptoms that all of us have at some time. We all have pain. We all have fatigue. We all have sleep disturbances. We all have um, anxiety. Those things are biologically integrated um, into our symptoms. COVID as a pandemic has ramped up all of those problems in our society as well so you know uh, it, it, people who listen to to this conversation i think most people get it but there are some people who 
you say, you know, well, you're just saying this is all, uh, you know, psychologic. We're, that is the last thing in the world we're saying. There is no psychologic. There is no immune system. There is no brain. It's one. And that's why uh, one of the one of the handouts that I, I gave you, I said, you know, brain and immune system are one organ. The immune system is the seventh sense of the brain. And we need to be able to work with it and manipulate it. And uh, I am just so excited to, you know, engage uh, uh, A in this research. And I'm even more excited to engage in it one and one with my patients. The immune system is the seventh sense. I I love this. Um, you know, I, I will I will tell you that it is so powerful to hear someone that has so much research background talk about this because sometimes patients are afraid that we are sharing with them something that's woo woo or sharing that with them something that like basically almost like oh just do mind body medicine and that's it like okay i i'm not gonna follow up with you like it doesn't matter just do this right and hearing you share the science behind all of those techniques also saying that, look, we're still learning, so there's probably more that we're going to discover. That is so powerful. I mean, I wish I had, <laughs> you know, it's funny. I wish I had um, had this conversation before my cancer, because for me, there was a constant battle between my left brain and my right brain. My left brain told me, like, this is, this is useless. This is woo-woo. What are you doing? And my right brain was like, well, I feel good. So it doesn't matter. I feel good. I just had chemo and I'm still feeling okay. And I feel good doing Qigong and I feel good doing meditation. So I'm going to continue to do this. And it's only later that I had the time to really sit down and start looking at the research behind all of those. And hearing you share this is so powerful because we can actually tell our patients, look, there is all of those things you can do. Um, it's empowering to, yes. to it's an empowering message and and that's how I, I call immune strength and hopefully soon we'll be able to you know uh, make this available widely mm -hmm. is that you know once people understand the brain immune relationship i say you know you have you have a disease of the immune system that is, you know, interwound and in, in, in everything uh, about your your mind, body, and spirit, and that you have the power yes. to modify that because they're not separate things; they're they're together. So, you know, if I know that I can affect my immune system through how I eat, how I sleep, uh, how I exercise, and how I handle my stress. Mm -hmm. That's an empowering message. You know, you're going to do it or you're not going to do it. Yes. You know, you can do it and yes. let's do it together. Yeah, I, I love this. I think that this is such a, a good message to finish uh, this episode on, which is that there is so much that we can do as patients. There is so much that everyone can do as patients are non patient so that we do not become patients. <laughs> um, but the, the mind, the body, the we we forget that the body like we forget to listen to our body i think that that's a, a number one so we forget we we work a lot in our in our um in our brain uh you know when you're looking at a video yeah uh uh and and i think that that's extremely powerful to learn about all of those things that we can do anyway so dr calabrese Thank you so, so much uh, for sharing your wisdom with us and re your research. I really hope we can take a, a, do another episode uh, later that you can come on the platform again. It has been such an honor, such a pleasure to have you uh, among us. Uh, do you have any words of wisdom that you want to share before going and before closing this episode? No, I want to congratulate you for this um, uh, podcast and, and, and your own journey uh sharing it with everyone um it is an empowering message and i'm just privileged to be here so thank you so much thank you so much hello so i hope you enjoyed this episode um please reach out if you think that i can work with you and i can help you achieve the best life for you do not hesitate on abridgemd.com there's a contact form ask to be a new patient, ask for information. 
In the meantime, you can share this podcast and share it with someone that you love and that you think will benefit from it. Have a wonderful day and I will see you next week.